In the hunt this offseason to improve the Sacramento Kings roster, could the unicorn Kristaps Porzingis be a realistic target for the Sacramento Kings? Plus, what do the Kings do about their two two-way guys, Namias Keita and Keon Ellis? We'll discuss it all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all offseason long. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. And when you enter promo code locked on NBA, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. And the Kristaps Porzingis idea is something that I'm surprised I didn't explore a little bit more in the Harrison Barnes sign and trade podcast uh, that I did. I don't know if that was last week or earlier this week. All the days blend together at this point. But recently, I did a Harrison Barnes sign and trade uh, episode where I, I explored and put together five different sign and trade options for a potential uh, Harrison Barnes move. And uh, I never explored... Christoph Porzingis and a trade with the Washington Wizards. I kind of glossed over it. And what made me revisit it was I, I received a message uh, from JD on Twitter, who's a, uh, a big fan of the podcast. JD, thank you so much. Hope you're listening, my man. Uh, and, and he asked me directly about Christoph Porzingis and what I thought about the Kings trying to go after Porzingis and bring him to Sacramento. And I, I gave him kind of a uh, a quick answer without really doing a lot of research, without looking at Porzingis' numbers and his contract and thinking about what it would take to get him here. And there's ways to like the fit. There's questions of how he would work defensively, questions with how he would work offensively. But like I on the surface, I thought, yeah, it's maybe something to consider. So I decided, you know what, why not take the time before recording a podcast, really spend like a half an hour or so diving into his numbers and diving into what it would potentially take to get him here in Sacramento and, and his contract situation and, and, and seeing if one, it's a worthy podcast topic and two, uh, if it's something that could happen or if it couldn't happen, why? Uh, and, and I thought it was actually, I found enough or put together enough of my own um, idea to present it here on locked on King. So, First off, let's talk about what Kristaps uh, Porzingis did this past year uh, with the Washington Wizards, because in many ways, he had a complete resurgence. He averaged 23 points, eight rebounds, two point assists uh, a game in 32 minutes. He also played in 65 games. That number is important, that 65 number. I'll get back to that in a second. His shooting splits were really, really solid. 49% from the field. 38% from three-point range. Really could be rounded up to 39 if you want. And 85%. From the free throw line, he uh, averaged two made threes in five and a half attempts per game. And now let's go over like some of the career highs for Porzingis this year in Washington, because we didn't think much of the Washington Wizards. They weren't a good basketball team, even though they came into Sacramento and, and, and beat the Kings. So some could say, oh, Kristaps Porzingis had a career year, but he did it on a bad team that didn't go anywhere. So it doesn't really mean anything, but still individually looking at what Kristaps did, he had a career high in scoring, career high in three-point shooting, career high in field goal percentage. So offensively, Kristaps Porzingis had a fantastic uh, season. And on top of that, remember I mentioned the 65 games, that's the second most games in a season that he has played since the second year of his career where he played 66 games. He uh, injured his ACL, had that significant ACL injury during the 2017-2018 season. Since then, he sat out for an entire season, played 57 games, 43 games, 51 games, now back to 65. So taking away what the Washington Wizards team did, and looking at the year that Christoph Porzingis had, very encouraging, very positive. He looks like he's back to himself and what he was when people were ready to label him a star in the face of the New York Knicks. Like, 
it was good. He looked he was he looked really solid this year. If he averaged these numbers on a good basketball team, which that might be the caveat for some of you saying, Matt, he didn't. He he doesn't. If the Washington Wizards were good, then we would be talking about him completely differently. You're absolutely right. Like if Kristaps Porzingis was here in Sacramento and averaged these numbers, he would have gotten significant significantly more attention uh, than he got this year uh, in Washington. He does a lot of what the Sacramento Kings could need. I mean, he averages one and a half blocks per game. That number slightly down from um, from the year before. Not a career high in that aspect, but he protects the rim. I mean, for God's sake, he's seven foot two. He's a really, really tall, long, lanky player. He would play the center for the Sacramento Kings. If the Kings acquired Christoph Porzingis, and we'll get into the money and we'll get into the trades and, and that whole scenario in a second. If the Kings acquired Christoph Porzingis, he's absolutely a starter. He's your starting five. So that means you're moving DeMontis Sabonis to the four because DeMontis Sabonis is not seven feet tall and you're moving uh, Keegan Murray likely to the three. Now this could work because Kristaps Porzingis can space the floor. So you can still, and you are still going to run everything primarily through DeMontis Sabonis. His role is not going to change theoretically despite the fact that he's changed positions. He won't play the five. He'd play the four in this scenario. The Kings would still primarily run the ball through him. Kristaps Porzingis can be in the corner or on the wing, can step out, can hit outside shots, but can also uh, attack the rim uh, when needed, can set picks uh, when needed. You can work him in the post a little bit if you want to. Like Kristaps Porzingis is good enough on offense where I think, okay, theoretically I could see the fit. Defensively, in terms of paint and rim protection, great. The concern that I have defensively is one of DeMontis Sabonis or Kristaps Porzingis has to guard fours. And fours can be small ball fours. They can be just a little bit taller, highly athletic threes. like, Or they could be big bang down low fours. If it's a bang down low four, then I have no problem with DeMontis Sabonis necessarily guarding that player. But let's talk about, in the case of Kings Warriors again, if Kristaps Porzingis was on the Kings during the NBA playoffs, the Kings would have had serious defensive problems. Because maybe you could put Kristaps Porzingis on Kavon Looney, and that would have helped with securing more rebounds and, uh, and and that would have helped with protecting the paint a little bit defensively. But does that mean that DeMontis Sabonis is going to be guarding Draymond Green? It's doable, except Draymond Green's going to take him out to the perimeter from time to time. So that the defensive concerns of having both Porzingis and Sabonis on the floor at the same time far outweigh any offensive concerns. And I think the offense could work. But let's let's talk about what would even, how Porzingis would even get here. Right, contract wise, he's going into uh, a uh, thirty-six million dollar player option. He has a thirty-six million dollar play option, which I think he'd be a fool to turn down. He's not going to get that money on the open market. He's just not worth that. That's the very end of his uh, crazy contract. Well, not crazy, big contract that he signed uh, with the Dallas Mavericks, I believe. So he's got a thirty-six million dollar player option. He should accept it, which means essentially he's a one-year thirty-six million dollar player that the Sacramento Kings would bring in. So here's the only realistic way that I thought of, semi-realistic way, to get a Kristaps Porzingis trade between the Kings and Wizards done. What I put together is it's a Harrison Barnes sign and trade to the Wizards, and I adjusted the number slightly because a lot of you didn't like the four-year, $18 million per year deal that I had for uh, for Barnes uh, in, in the in the sign and trade podcast that I did. So I did a three year, seventeen million dollar deal per year with the third year being a team option. Better, I don't know, whatever. I just that's the number that that I came up with. And all so you'd have to send that money to the Wizards, and you're still needing to send another contract there to balance out the money a little bit. So you're also adding Rashawn Holmes and his deal to the mix. And even when you're sending both of those players in the sign and trade and Rashawn Holmes' contract, you're still taking on $6 million of salary in this deal. There's two problems with this. Two big problems with this trade. Uh, actually, maybe three. No, nah, two, two problems with this trade. Number one, the Washington Wizards are likely rebuilding. If they're trading Kristaps Porzingis away, they're probably rebuilding. Even though Bradley Beal's still there, I think they're going to probably lose Kyle Kuzma. 
to me, and based off of what I read and doing a little bit of research, it seems like they're they're trending more towards rebuild than they are going for it in the Eastern Conference because they had a halfway decent roster. I know they dealt with injuries, but they had a halfway decent roster and they still didn't even make the plan in the Eastern Conference. So they're likely trending towards a rebuild. So why would they want to take Harrison Barnes? Harrison sure could help young players. We talked about that with like the idea of sending Harrison to a team like Orlando or Houston or a team that that could bring him in where he could be a mentor in very similar fashion to how he was a mentor for years with the uh, with the Sacramento Kings. But I don't know why it would make sense for the Wizards to take Harrison Barnes. And on top of that, in a sign and trade, Harrison Barnes has to agree to go. He has to agree to basically sign with the Washington Wizards. Why would he do that? He finally got to a good spot here with the Sacramento Kings. Finally. He's finally in a position where he's like, I dealt with crap for years upon years that I was here. Finally, the Kings are in a good position. If I'm leaving, I want to go to a team that is contending or has a good chance at winning. Unless I'm getting the truck backed up and I'm getting paid a boatload of money to deal with the scenario that I'm in. And in this case, $17 million a year on a three-year deal, which is essentially a two-year deal, a two-year deal with all the power of the third year in the hands of the team. Why would Harrison Barnes want to do that? So that's one big problem. The other big problem is this. Rashawn Holmes is owed $12 million next season and has an additional $12 million player option the following season, which he's almost guaranteed to exercise based off of where his value is right now. Rashawn Holmes essentially has two years, $24 million left on his deal. Why, if the Wizards are rebuilding, would they want to take that money on? It makes no sense. Essentially, if you're going to get the Wizards to trade you the better player take on a player that is a good player in Harrison Barnes and a good leader in Harrison Barnes and certainly someone that they wouldn't mind having in their organization, but doesn't necessarily make sense for their roadmap going forward. And a terrible contract, even though I like Rashawn Holmes a lot and think he could help the Wizards. If they're going to do that, you're going to have to throw in significant draft compensation to get them to be okay with that because the Kings aren't trading away their young players. Maybe Davion Mitchell, but even then you're like, eh. Like, the Kings aren't training their good young players that the Wizards would likely ask for or would want in a rebuild to bring Kristaps Porzingis over. So would you trade multiple first-round picks for Kristaps Porzingis? And on top of that, remember what I said about his contract situation. Kristaps Porzingis is basically on a one-year $36 million deal. So that means that next offseason, you have to worry about playing, paying Porzingis, Sabonis, and Malik Monk. Three out of your seven-man core at that point. All of this taken into account, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. It's not going to work. I don't think the Kings are really going to consider it. I don't see a future of Kristaps Porzingis with the Sacramento Kings. There are too many buts and too many what-ifs for not enough absolutes. Like, absolutely, that would work. Or absolute Would Kristaps Porzingis, if you could just forget about the money, forget about the trade... And, and and pluck them and put them on the Sacramento Kings and say, here you go. Would that make the Kings a ba better basketball team? Sure, it should. But it's not so much better that we can ignore what it's going to cost and his free agency status the very next year. Essentially, it's a it's a it's a probably just a rental, unless you can convince Christoph Sporzingis to take a pay cut, which I don't know. Maybe you can do that. So I, I don't think Christoph Sporzingis, the unicorn in Sacramento, I don't think is happening. But I want to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think the Kings should go for it? Or you're like an absolute no? Uh, let me know. At Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure Every single player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time. 
time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or you get your money back because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible island uh, eligible items only. Exclusions apply. What do you do with the two way guys? The Sacramento Kings, amongst their many decisions this off season, this is probably more of like a mild or minor decision to be made. One that shouldn't have massive long term ramifications, but still something that Sacramento Kings fans are interested in, especially when it comes to Namias Keita. I'm going to save him second. I'm going to talk about Keon Ellis first. So both of these guys are restricted free agents, essentially. Nimi spent two years on a two-way contract with the Sacramento Kings. Keon Ellis was a, um, a, a non undrafted free agency signing that immediately got a two-way contract with the Sacramento Kings on draft night last year. So clearly, the Kings did that because they saw a lot in Keon and saw how he could fit. And I remember talking about it that day and having um, a, a reporter who covered Alabama basketball and, and talking to him about what the Kings got and how it could potentially be a steal and, and yada, yada. And essentially the way I feel about Keon then is still the way I feel about him now, but maybe a little more positive. And, and what I mean by that is Keon Ellis presents something that the Sacramento Kings definitely can use three and D. Uh, I mean, he's a smaller kind of wing, maybe two and D type player can space the floor, uh, uh, for, uh, can hit from the outside is a good hard worker on the defensive end. Like I can see why the Kings organization and, 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 and Mike Brown's coaching staff and Bobby Jackson down in, in Stockton with the Stockton Kings, why they like Keon a lot. I think bringing Keon back is a great idea. And I, to me, if you think Keon needs a little more time instead of just letting him walk, do the same thing you did with Nimi. Give him a second two-way contract because I think Keon could still benefit from spending more time with the main roster. He had a really good season. He averaged 16.8 points per game, shot 51% from the field, 43% from three-point range, 78% from the free throw line, averaged five rebounds, three assists, and a steal with the Stockton Kings in just his first season. Like those are really, really good numbers. Remember when you're, you're, you're looking at players who play consistently in Stockton, consistently in the G league, you're looking for them to, to put up really good NBA type numbers in the G league to show that they're a tier above the other players that they're playing with. I think Keon did that to a certain extent. So I think the Kings giving Keon another two way contract just to use one of them. Cause they have two of them. Give him one allow him to continue to spend time with the main roster. If he gets better, you can see a pathway to where he gets spot minutes in Mike Brown's system and, and how he could help the Sacramento Kings, allow him to get even more confidence with another year of the G League under his belt and then reevaluate where he is the next offseason. And to me, I think this is a big summer for Keon. If, if, if the Kings do extend him another two-way contract, like I think Keon could come in, he will play in the California Classic in theory. He'll play in the... Uh, the NBA Summer League, I would be shocked if he didn't play uh, in either. And it's a real opportunity for him to say, okay, I'm the I'm the man on this team. I don't care who the Sacramento Kings draft at 24. I don't care who's out here with me. Keegan Murray's probably not going to play. Like, it's very, very likely not going to play. Why would he? There's no point. So Keon has a chance to say, this is my team. Like, these are my guys. And lead by example in that way. That's what I want to see out of Keon in the Summer League, if I'm being honest. Like, the most intriguing thing to me, other than what who the Kings select with 24 and how he performs. The most intriguing thing for me in the, uh, in the summer league this year is what Keon Ellis looks like. So I, I very much hope that the Kings bring Keon Ellis back and I'm very fine with them extending him a, a second uh, two-way contract. As for Namias Keda, kind of different story. And Namias is the guy that, I've been asked about a lot, like a lot from Sacramento Kings fans. Like, hey, the Kings need a backup center. Is Nimi, is Nimi ready? Is Nimi that guy? You're asking the wrong person in the sense that like, I paid attention as much as I could. I watched in person two or three, no, only two. One of them was here in Sacramento, Stockton Kings games this year. I paid as much attention as you did or as we could when Nimi would get spot minutes and, and when he got opportunities with the main roster as well. In theory, 
Nimi does so many things that the Kings need. Provides rim protection, provides rebounding, is a big body and presence in the paint. So in theory, Nimi is good for the Kings. That's why they probably had him around for the last two years to develop him into something that fits that need that they've had beyond just this past season. Nimi had a really, really good season with the Stockton Kings. Also averaged 16.8 points per game, shot 68% from the field, 10% from three-point range, but that's not his game. Who cares? Averaged like 0.3 attempts per game, so who cares? Shot 80% from the free throw line, which is good for a big. His eight rebounds per game, I wish that number was higher. Like, I wanted to see Nimi average a double-double in the G League, and he should have averaged a double-double in the G League. That being said, he was one of the best players in the G League. Also averaged two assists, two blocks per game. So you take those numbers shrink them down to what he would play in a 10 to 15 minute stint as a backup center every single night, but providing that rim protection, providing that rebounding and that efficient scoring around the rim. Yeah, that that could be what the Kings are looking for. But will he do that? Is he ready to do that? Because when he's got an NBA opportunity, I, I can't remember what team. No, it was the, um, was it the Lakers? And they threw him against Anthony Davis. No, it was a different... Nimi was thrown to the Wolves at some point this season. Guard, no, it was against Joel Embiid. Yeah, it was against Joel Embiid in the Philadelphia 76ers. Nimi was thrown to the Wolves, poor guy, and because the Kings were searching for a long time for an answer for those center minutes when DeMontis Sabonis was either unavailable or was simply getting rest, and they didn't have an answer for that for a long time. Nimi was thrown to the Wolves. He didn't do very well. He had some decent moments when he did play and got a few opportunities to play it. Uh, I think he played like, what, two or three straight games or something like that. And then we never really saw him much after that. He was given a small opportunity, was thrown to the wolves, didn't perform to the level that obviously the Kings were hoping, but also like, what are you doing? You're throwing, you're throwing a two-way contract guy against the MVP. Like what, what are we doing here? So I'm not judging Nimi too heavily off of that. I'm more like, I'll put it this way. If the Sacramento Kings don't believe Nimi's ready, we have to trust the Sacramento Kings because they're watching him and paying attention to him far more than we are. Unless you're from Portugal, if unless you're Portuguese, then you're like probably following everything that Nimi does. And in fact, you could probably speak better to it than I could, I guess in that sense. But like if the Kings decide don't bring Nimi back, I understand it. I hope that's not the case because Nimi's awesome and he's worked hard and, and I've gotten the opportunity to chat with him a handful of times and and he seems really, really cool. And again, in theory, he provides a lot of things that the Sacramento Kings need from that backup center. Speaking of backup center, like the Kings as of right now, if you don't include the two-way contract spots, the Kings have six open roster spots that they have to fill. They're going to have some, some cap holds on some players like Harrison Barnes and Trey Lyles and, uh, probably and maybe Terrence Davis. I don't know. But... They have six roster spots, essentially, that they need to fill, plus two two-way contract spots. I don't think Nimi's getting a third two-way contract. I don't even know if he can. Like, I don't think he's getting a third. So, essentially, you have to use one of those roster spots for a backup center. You have to. So, is that the spot you give Trey Lyles, and you say you're going to play small ball four, uh, or small ball five? Like, is that what you're doing? Are you going out and getting another name to be that backup center? Or do you believe Nimi can have that spot? In addition to that, you probably maybe want a third string big as well. Is that a spot for Nimi? Do you want to spend two or more roster spots on your backup front court? Let's say they go out and get somebody. They bring Nimi back as the, like the third string center and they bring Trey Lyles back. That's half of those available roster spots are on fours and fives who are going to play with the second unit at best. Don't know if the Kings want to do that. Financially, they could probably afford to do that with Nimi not commanding a lot of money. I have no idea. Here are some rotational backup bigs that are available in free agency with more NBA experience. Dwight Powell, Thomas Bryant, Andre Drummond, Bismack Biombo, hell, even Chemezi Metu. Those are some names that I wrote down that are rotational bigs in the NBA who are free agents. Do the Kings like one of those names and trust one of those names more than they trust Nimi, who spent the last couple of years in their system and they know very well? We'll have to see. I hope Keon is back as a two-way contract. I hope Nimi is back on the main roster. I don't know if I would feel comfortable committing to Nimi going forward as my backup five. 
I think if Trey Lyles and Nimi were brought back, the plan would still be Trey Lyles is playing the five uh, as a small ball five going forward. And Nimi is kind of a in the wings, not a two-way contract player. So we'll spend the entire year with the main roster, but someone who is in the reserves, kind of similar to what Alex Len was for the majority of this season. That's the role that I likely see Nimi having with the Kings if they decide to bring him back and we'll see if they go in a different direction. But I know there are Portuguese fans out there that listen to Locked On Kings and I love you. Uh, tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me why Nimi needs to be on this team and he's ready to be that backup center. For those of you who maybe don't trust Nimi or, or let's let's talk about it. Let's discuss this a little bit and share your thoughts on Keon Ellis as well. You know how to reach me at Matt George Sack on Twitter, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com or leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are comfortable, they're stretchy, they're versatile, they are khakis, shorts, and pants that make you look good while also handling what you need to throw at them. I really enjoy using Bird Dogs uh, when I'm out golfing. I know I've talked about this before. I was actually wearing a Bird Dogs pair of pants last night or yesterday. Uh, I was in uh, Tahoe. I was playing golf at Edgewood. I, I got the opportunity to play at Edgewood and Tahoe, which is just a magnificent course if you ever gotten the opportunity to go out there. And I, I used Bird Dogs. Uh, I was playing in a, in a pair of bird dogs and it was a little bit chilly. There was a little bit of rain and some weather, but nothing too bad, but they're comfortable. They're easy to play in uh, and you can rock them whether you're doing something athletic, you can rock them something casual. Even if you need to go kind of semi-formal, you could rock a pair of bird dogs, uh, whether it's shorts or pants. They're extremely comfortable. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. Enter promo code locked on NBA for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NBA for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take off your bird dogs. We promise you that. I was thinking about squeezing this topic in here at the end, but I decided it needed a little more thought it needed more time and it needed interaction from you. I think this is a really, really big year for Davion Mitchell. Like, I think this is kind of going to be a, a make or break year with who Davion Mitchell is, not in his NBA career, because there's more to his potential outside of Sacramento, but who he is with this Sacramento Kings team. Like, is he going to be a long-term part of this team going forward? And if so, we know he solidified himself on defense, but can he solidify himself as a backup point guard? I know Malik Monk takes a lot of the ball handling and, and, and floor general responsibilities. That's fine. If that's the route that the Kings want to go, that's fine. But can Davion be enough of an offensive impactful player to where his defense is really felt and he has enough time to make those big defensive plays and those big defensive moments. I thought Davion Mitchell had a lot of really, really good moments towards the end of the season and some really good moments in the playoff series uh, against the Golden State Warriors. was a little surprised that Mike Brown went away from him as heavily as he did in the final couple of games, game six and game seven. But I want to spend more time talking about this in the future. I'll throw the question out right now, throw the topic out right now. Uh, I might have a guest on to discuss this more as training camp gets a little bit closer, but how big of a year this is for Davion Mitchell, the confidence level in him going forward. Uh, what are you thinking about Davion? How are you feeling about him going forward? What do you need to see from him this off season in terms of growth? And yeah, what's your general confidence level in off night? And, and do you see him as part of the Kings core going forward to hopefully win championships? Or do you see him kind of, barely on the outside trying to claw his way in. Where are you at with Davion Mitchell? Be sure to let me know that. I appreciate your support as always. In addition, please weigh in on the idea of Christoph Porzingis. Weigh in on your thoughts uh, of Nimi uh, and Keon Ellis. Decisions, decisions, decisions to make this offseason for the Sacramento Kings. This is a lot of fun. If you have any other questions uh, like I got about Christoph Porzingis about other players that potentially could be available that the Kings could go and target or any questions about maybe draft prospects that I can talk about, discuss, have a guest on about, or do a little research on, send those to me. I love to answer them. Sometimes I'll answer them off the air. Sometimes like this time I'll bring them on the air and bring them onto the podcast uh, and talk about it. So please send those to me. Appreciate your support as always. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.